Hi, you guys, and welcome back to the podcast. We are the Carwells. I'm Emily. And I'm Sarah, and we are, as you know, Airbnb interior designers and investors. (laughs) Well, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I can't. (laughs) It's like I can't get it together. Hold on. Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome back. (laughs) <laughs> to catching up with the Carwells. Emily and I were having such a personal conversation before this and we're trying to gather ourselves, so mind us. Um, but today's episode is just Emily and I. We are going to be catching you guys up on everything that's going on in our lives, both a little bit with the mentorship, a lot of it with all of our properties that we've got coming to life currently and there is no shortage of chaos and excitement around us right now and we love bringing y'all with us so that's what we're covering today um but let's start off with where you're at or where you are at in your property emily because you guys have made some big moves here in the last couple of weeks yes i've spent a lot of money in the past couple of weeks (laughs) which is terrifying and also really exciting at the same time So we purchased our flooring and we're getting it scheduled to be installed, which means that we have to, because as you guys know, I'm living in this property, like full time living in this property. So there's a bunch of furniture in it. Some of it's Airbnb furniture, some of it's just personal furniture, and it all has to be moved out. And so we're doing it like by floor, kind of, which is going to be complicated. And we have to like move our washer and dryer too. So we have to like take off the gas, like turn off the gas hookup to it, turn off the water to it, move all that because they're going to be reflooring in there too. But we paid for all that and we're getting that scheduled. Um, We bought a hot tub, which I told Sarah this, I was like looking at all these different hot tubs and we're always trying to find one that's going to like seat the number of people that actually stay at the property. But it's really hard to find like an actual 10 person hot tub that can fit 10 people. My house is going to sleep eight, but I'm hoping eventually to get it up to 10. Um, But I found one that's all bench seating, so it can actually fit more people, which is so exciting. And the color is super cute. It's like this marbly, like tan. That's what the interior is. It's not just like plain white. So I'm very excited. It came with one of those like lift covers. Love that. (laughs) That no one knows how to use. (laughs) No one knows how to use, but it came with it, which those usually you have to pay extra for. So I'm really excited for that, but I have to like actually get stuff moving because they're just holding the hot tub for us until we get our concrete laid. So I have to rent a dumpster, clear out all of the shit that the people who owned this house before us left just like everywhere in the yard. There's like bird feeders, bird baths, um, like planters everywhere. There's like this massive pile of wood, but it's in this like weird contraption that I also have to break down and throw away it's there's just so much stuff to get out of the way so working on all of that painting putting up wallpaper but all of this started I started doing a lot of this and having to like piecemeal it because I had contractors come out here and try to like get bids for stuff and literally all of them ghosted me which is just (laughs) so annoying because like I even was talking to one because like the they waited like three weeks before even reaching back out again and being like, Oh, Hey, I lost your email. Can I send this to you? I'm like, yeah, please do. And then he doesn't send it. But I was like, Hey, my timeline is like different now. So like I have to cut some of this stuff off of your list because I had to make decisions about what I actually need done because like you're fucking with my timeline at this point. And he was like, Oh, okay. But I was like, I've decided we're going to redo our deck next year instead of this year. Because the deck is fine as it is. Nobody's going to miss it if it's not done right now. And I just have like other things that I want to get done. And my timeline just moved up. So I was like, if you guys can come and do this stuff, I also want to put you on the schedule for next year, like next May to do my deck. So like guaranteed work for next year already too. nothing. He has completely ghosted me. And I'm like, that just baffles me that people are like ghosting people who are going to like that deck's not going to be cheap. It's going to be very expensive to do. And he just like, doesn't respond so yeah the contractor thing is very annoying so I have like some random guy that the hot tub guy gave me he was like oh yeah my buddy he has like a business he lays concrete he'll come out and do your concrete pad for you and so he's doing that that's why I have to clear up a bunch of stuff but we are making moves in this household (laughs) 
Right. Well, and I think it's like, you know, in theory, it would be so nice to be able to just like hire one team to do all the work. But in actual reality, it's like almost to your advantage to hire separate people for every single thing, because a lot of their timelines are different. Um, And then also, it's like, if you get someone who's like terrible, and you hired them for the whole thing, then you're stuck with them through the whole process. But if you find someone great, then you want them to stay. And it's just yeah I totally understand like at the beginning when people were like you know when we were like oh my gosh we're gonna have a new place in every single state that we want to like go to and travel to and now I and I was like oh how hard is it gonna be to set up another team in another area it's so hard yeah. <laughs> like finding people to do good work is so so hard yeah the flooring installation is being done by the Home Depot team so like mm-hmm. they it's like I think 275 per square foot, but they come in, they rip up all the existing flooring, they take it and throw it away. That's worth it. That's worth the 275 in and of itself. Please, for the love of God, get rid of the trash. Like the last thing I need is this carpet just sitting in my garage. I would have paid them 275 just to do that, but then they'll also install it. And they install the quarter round all the way around as well. Like they do all of it. And I was like, heaven sent. Thank you. Yep, please. I will take that. And I was able to get that fully scheduled, which, yeah, no, I'm like, I'm kind of happy with how things like played out. I, it, it made me prioritize in a way that I really wasn't prioritizing before, which is probably a good thing. Um, but so with the concrete guy, so it's the hot tub guy's friend who like does his concrete for him. And I, he called him while I was standing there while we were like, paying for the hot tub and talks to him on the phone and I hear the concrete guy say I have a two thousand dollar minimum that pad doesn't sound like it's going to be two grand so I don't know if I want to do this job and the guy was like just go out to their house it's like near your shop anyways so the guy comes out and he quotes me exactly two thousand dollars for this pad it's like a 10 by 14 or 10 by 15 or something like that and I'm like whatever I need it sure I heard that on the phone so that's like the number I had in my head anyways we'll go for it but then I'm like I have no frame of reference for that this is the first time I'm having a concrete pad laid I've never had that before my parents have had concrete laid before but I haven't so like I don't know what I'm supposed to think this costs and I know that the price of concrete like changes right so I call my dad because they've had a concrete pad laid and my dad works for like a company that would know this And so I call him and I'm like, am I getting completely screwed by this guy? Like it's a 10 by 15. And he goes, let me just call the guy who does all of the work for us. And so he calls him and the guy was like, no, actually, that's like a good price for that size pad. And I'm like, oh, thank God. But like, how are you supposed to know if you don't have somebody to call? And that's the thing. Like, it sounds I hate the oh, let me call my dad type thing because it makes me feel like like a little kid, but also thank God I have that resource to call and be like, hey, am I getting completely screwed on this? Because I don't want to be, but it's like stuff that I need, right? Like I have to have something to put the hot tub on. So I need it. But is the guy could easily just be like, mm, two grand because that's what I want it to be. Yeah. Well, and it's like, okay, all day long, we'll preach, you know, get multiple quotes, get multiple quotes so you can compare. But when you're trying to get multiple quotes in these small towns and like you've called 15 GCs and you've gotten calls back from none of them or the calls that you have gotten back when you've like finally contacted them, then they start ghosting you. It's just like, you know, I feel like they prioritize like big projects, not in the like our version of big, but like their version of big, which would be like a new build or like commercial construction or something that's going to be like, hey, I want a, one project to last a month. And so it's like increasingly difficult to find someone to do these like one off one day projects. Mm-hmm. And then to get multiple quotes on top of it is even harder. <laughs> and so it's just like you get stuck in this like weird situation of being like, okay, I'm so desperate to have someone come and do it because I need it done. And this person is telling me that they will do it in my timeline. But like, am I getting absolutely hosed on price? I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm just paying for the timeline that I need. But I guess that's like, chalk it up as part of the being in this business, because the timeline has to be important. <laughs> but it just brings me back to like, thank God we make this like kind of a family affair. Because like my dad is yeah. coming up here. 
And my dad's not like a builder by any means, but he's handy. Like he does things around the house for my mom all the time. And so I was like, uh, dad, I need to switch out like all the boob lights in my house. Gone. We're taking all of those out. But also I'm switching out all of the ceiling fans in the bedrooms and all of the fixtures like on the, the sink fixtures and stuff like that. And I was like, dad, do you know how to do that? And he was like, yeah, I've done that before. I'm like, thank God. Because like, I don't know how to do it. And dad so literally the first time my parents are gonna see my house is like in two weeks they're coming up here for a weekend and i'm just putting them to work like it's like mother's day weekend and so i'll probably like take my mom out to dinner but literally i was like sorry dad i know you just had shoulder surgery but i need your help <laughs> our dads are like straight godsends for both of us they right. just like and they carry the weight of their entire family. I know. I My dad was like, I might need your help, like, lifting some stuff because of my shoulder. And I was like, okay, just tell me what to do because, like, I literally have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm just yeah. going to learn. I, yeah. I like the idea of doing it myself because then I learn and then the next time I can be like, oh, yeah, I actually know how to do that because going forward, ideally going forward, I will hire everything out. But, like, sometimes that's just not going to be the case. So I need to know right. how to do a lot of stuff. Like I'm tiling in front of my fireplace because it's not like yep. super important, right? Like it's not a super important area. If it gets a little screwed up, it's fine, but it'll be like my practice tile. So I'm doing the tile in front of my fireplace. My mom's like, are you sure? And I was like, yep, I got this. I watched a bunch of videos and I'm going to test it out. And if it turns out horrible, it's just the tile in front of the fireplace. Like who cares about that? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be fine. Well, and it's just like, I know we have had multiple conversations about that or about this specifically recently. It's like, okay, in theory, like hiring it out, whatever it is, not even like specifically construction related, like I'm going through it with logos right now too, or with floor plans or whatever. Half the time, like when you're talking about changing light fixtures or creating a logo or doing like five square foot of tile work or whatever the case may be, it's literally going to take you more time to find someone else to do it than for you to just do it yourself and like be a YouTube warrior and figure it out. Mm. And so it's like, okay, we're constantly trying to find ways to like take back our time and like pay to have our time taken back. And then in turn, we then pay for it, but then it takes more time on top of it. And I'm like, okay, how are people like actually scaling effectively? And how long does it actually take to like, develop people and systems around you to do it correctly or like better than you could <laughs> yeah I think people like at some point it becomes forced like you are so far away from your property that you have to hire it out you don't have a choice and because this is what we're doing full-time and we like live either close to or at our properties it's so hard for me to justify hiring it out when I'm here anyways and so I think right. maybe eventually, like, we'll be forced to get to that point because we won't be living in them or they'll be farther away. So we'll be forced to hire it out. But right now I'm like, because like even the contractor's like, are you going to paint the whole house yourself? And I'm like, yeah, I'm here. So like, why wouldn't I do that easy job of painting myself? Now, does it look as good as like maybe if a professional did it? Probably not. But like, it's done and it looks good enough. And so I was like, I can't justify hiring somebody to paint my whole house when I'm here but when you're yeah. far away yeah, yeah. I, totally <laughs> I totally agree that is the one portion that I am continuing to outsource here in West Michigan because for those of you listening Emily is like not West Michigan she's like Northeast Michigan <laughs> um but the painter that I hired for Orange Cadillac on this house I was like do you travel to Big Rapids and he was like yes and I was like oh my gosh you were the only person that I've hired so far that I would hire again <laughs> and if you're saying you will do it then you are doing it <laughs> that's so funny well I will say and you've said this about me and Tyler says this about me too I'm very fast when it comes to painting so obnoxiously fast I, don't I just know what it is I don't know what it is about me either because like I have this like toxic another toxic trait Shocking. of I know I add it to the giant list the book that we've got going now but like for whatever reason when I paint I have to like paint the outside like edge it and then I have to stand back and I have to look at it for 30 minutes and decide if I like the edging and then I'll like go in and I'll put like a quarter of the wall on with a roller and then I'll stand back and I'll have to like spend 30 minutes staring at it like admiring the color again and then I'll look over at what you're doing and you've got like the rest of the room painted and I'm like <laughs> 
how? <laughs> Literally, I painted like my entire downstairs and upstairs hallway and bathroom in like a week maybe and that was like while also doing like my everyday job yeah just no <laughs> Tyler Literally was painting no. with me in our our bedroom he started painting and I looked over at him and I was like what are you doing <laughs> and he was like holding the brush like this and like trying to brush it was the weirdest way to hold a brush and I was like you're doing it wrong and it's not even going on correctly and he was like I don't know how to do this and I was like leave I was like, I can't tell if you're doing that thing that like sometimes husbands will do. Well, they'll do they'll do it wrong on purpose so they don't have to be asked to do it again. Well, it worked because it was so <laughs> annoying. And I was like, you're doing it completely wrong. And you're honestly just in my way at this point. He literally painted like one corner of the room and I painted the entire rest and the closets before he got finished with that one corner. And I was like, you're done. Get out. <laughs> yeah well i mean maybe you have a hidden talent there that you're just like an expert painter because i just like i remember painting next to you and being like i'm so glad she's on my team but like i am not keeping up you could do all the murals it's not my role. i can do some murals but yours are just much more intricate so that's where you spent your time while i was painting the rest of the apartment yeah maybe there's something about having adhd that's like fine with murals but like not fine with big colors i guess. just can't do it it's too boring it's uh, all just one flat surface for you that yeah, sense. I had the when the painter came out today, uh, he came out to the Big Rapids house to quote the Big Rapids house. And he's like already like just done working on one project with me. He's already familiar with how I work. We would like get to, into any room and he would be like, OK, what about the ceiling? And I'm like, OK, I haven't decided yet. And he's like, OK, what about the doors? And I'm like, I don't know yet. And he finally he goes, here's a quote for the maximum amount of work that I could possibly do in here. And we'll just go room by room and we'll adjust it as we go. <laughs> like genius thank you. <laughs> what a smart guy <laughs> so good well, uh, speaking you of your big rap- such a hard time yeah speaking of your big rapids property you closed on friday yes so Woo. tell people next steps after closing because you immediately dove in head first into that one so hey uh Yeah, maybe this episode will just be a series of the current horror stories that are going on in my life. (laughs) Oh, yeah, we did. Y'all like to hear that. We didn't do a horror story, so it can be. Well, me getting attacked by the stink bug is horror enough, but. (laughs) Yeah, true. Um, Let's see. Let's talk about what fires are going on, and we'll start with Big Rapids, I suppose. Big Rapids doesn't have any fires yet. Um, That house we did close on. it's going to be amazing. It's going to be the first house that we have designed specifically for families with kids, um, which is a market that I know the least about, right? <laughs> As I don't have any children. So, um, but the house is just perfect for kids. Like the attic upstairs is the ceiling is six foot exactly. So like any tall man cannot go up into the attic, but it's like a perfect space for kids toys. It's got like already built in like toy boxes upstairs and, um, and it's got a slide outside and it's got a basketball hoop and I don't know. It just, it's very, very fa- You can tell that like grandma and grandpa owned it and it was grandma and grandpa who loved their grandkids. And so everything about that house, just, you can tell was perfectly catered towards children. Um, so we're, we're going for it. Um, and that one doesn't have any, any, um, issues so far, but we also are, a week out from getting the school bus listed on Airbnb, um, which is amazing. We found a campground that's allowing us to arbitrage a campsite, or I guess multiple campsites throughout the summer. We have to move the bus about four times um, throughout the summer season. But this morning, or I guess yesterday, we finally got in the bus, got it all set up, and Ethan and I are staying in the bus for the next couple of days just to work out all the kinks, right? We want to like use everything. We want to make sure it all works. Um, and I ordered this super cool retro fridge for the bus and plugged it in for the first time yesterday and let it cool down all night long. And we woke up this morning and it's like 7am and I'm like, you know, thinking that everything's working in the bus and we open the fridge and it's just like so warm. (laughs) It's like, why? Um, so that was a little bit of a fire this morning, but not bad. Um, The two big fires that I'm actually dealing with currently 
well, one is relatively resolved, but the other one is not resolved. Um, one fire that I dealt with two weeks ago was um, right after we launched Orange Cadillac. And this is, I don't think I've shared this story on um, anywhere, actually. I don't think I've talked about it anywhere on socials. And it's been the biggest fire that's been happening kind of in the background um, that I didn't want to talk about until it was resolved. But right after we finished Orange Cadillac, Literally the day that we listed it on Airbnb, um, we got a cease and desist letter for Airbnb Orange Cadillac. And we had done plenty of research on the front end to make sure that it was legal. Um, Cadillac's regulation was that if it was zoned B2 specifically, that you just had to get some sort of a license um, from the city to, you know, properly short term rental it out. Well, they sent us this cease and desist letter and I was like, you know, brought them the stack of paperwork that I had that showed that it was zoned B2 and it was legal. Um, and they let us know that only half of our property was zoned B2. Um, and of course, it was the half with the pool. So it wasn't the half with the house itself where people are actually staying, mm -hmm. where we could argue like, hey, nobody's actually staying on this portion of the house. Um, but the city was really, you know, great about it. He was like, you know what, you know, we're pretty short term rental friendly here. Like we just need to rezone the rest of your property, so on and so forth. So we went and we had a meeting with the city to get it rezoned. Um, that voting process was a little wonky where at first we really didn't think they were going to allow us to rezone it. And the reason they didn't want us to rezone it was because a lot of the board members originally thought it was zoned residentially, so they thought if they changed ours and they would have to change it across the board for everyone else. Once we clarified that it was already half zoned correctly, then everybody was on board. Um, and since then, it's been rezoned. But the day that it got rezoned, where the voting process went through, we had already pled our case, they had already said it was legal, um, and that we could continue operating. The day that the meeting was held where they were going to announce the rezoning of it, so decisions already been made. They're just telling the city like, hey, this is now rezoned to all B2 instead of B2 and OS2. Um, someone in the city wrote an article on Cadillac's local online newspaper um, saying that we had applied to have it rezoned and that the decision was that night. And so even though we knew that it was already decided, of course, it's like great clickbait news. And because we are so vocal with Orange Cadillac on socials, all of a sudden, we're just getting like tagged nonstop in this article that's like basically like giving all the information like, do you think it should be an Airbnb or do you not? And of course, you've got people who are like extreme one way or the other. Um, and so we just got so much noise on social media from that. Like I was on TikTok and there was like one girl specifically that was going back to videos that were like two years old and just absolutely annihilating <laughs> <laughs> she was like my whole family is losing sleep over this <laughs> oh just my like gosh really letting it affect her yeah day. yeah she really was was not happy about it but um yeah it was just misinformation again it was like you know prime case of the news just being absolute clickbait but um yeah so the whole city is now very aware that it's a short-term rental um, but it's legal and they allowed us to switch it. And so we're in great standing, but everyone was like, car walls are operating illegally. You know, <laughs> internally, we were like, literally, no, <laughs> like, that's, that's not it at that's all. That's actually not happening at all, but okay. Yeah. But it, you know, all publicity is good publicity. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah. And then the last fire again with the regulation blech, is so we, um, on our very first property, just like you guys are doing with yours, where you're like literally living in the property while renovating it, it is your primary residence. That was the case with our very first property. And now, um, again, with this big rapids property where we don't have a home, right? We live on site while we're renovating. And so the first property that we bought, um, we bought with a conventional loan, 5% down, our personal names on it. It's not in an LLC. Um, and really, once you're once you start renting it out, even if you don't move it into an LLC, which I learned this today, so I didn't even know that we were like technically operating illegally for the last six months while we haven't been living there. Um, you have to even if you don't quit claim deed 
the property into an LLC, you have to remove the homestead on it so that you are paying commercial taxes, or I guess rental property taxes versus primary residence taxes. And so if it's your primary residence and you haven't taken off that homestead on your property, then you're getting a huge tax break for something that you're not living in. And so we didn't understand that difference, right? It's like one of the 8 million things that you learn when you get into real estate. Um, and so our lender last week, as we're, you know, moving into this big rapids house to start redoing it, we were like, okay, so we have to remove the homestead on the previous property and we have to make the homestead over here while we're renovating it and then remove it off of that once we're done renovating it. And she was like, well, she was like, I don't want to tell you what to do. She was like, but people usually don't like check these things. And she was like being kind of shady about it, which I'm like, okay, I'm like, we've done the shady thing in the past and I'm just like, not about it anymore. I just like, don't want to go down that rabbit hole. She was like, you technically could homestead the Bitely house under your name and you could homestead the Big Rapids house under your husband's name and I was like mm, I don't. like sure I love that you're like willing to gray line this with me or gray area this with me but like I'm not I don't know like there was too many red flags so today I call the assessor who we have to submit the like receding of the homestead on the Bitely house we have to like mail him this form or something um and so I was like I was like, Ethan, I'm going to be like so honest with this guy and I just need him to like tell me what the right thing to do is. Like if it's like truly a gray area and like the assessor who makes that decision is like cool with it, then we'll go that way. And like maybe I'm missing something, but it just like I don't think we can keep this as our homestead, even though we do use it when people aren't there. Like it's like way less than 50 percent of the time. Um, and so I call the assessor. I tell him all like the whole entire thing. Um I'm like, look, we're on site when it's vacant, but like it's booked out way more than it's vacant. So it's like less than 50%. Yada, yada. We're, we have one here. We have one here. We don't. Anyway, I digress. But he goes, look, he was like, I agree with your lender that like you and your husband could homestead each individually, even if you spend less than 50% of the time. He's like, nobody's like watching it like a hawk, right? Like, I believe you that you're like there and, um, and so on and so forth. He was like, but <laughs> he was like, because Bitely is currently developing short term rental regulations. And at this point, I hadn't given him my address yet, right? We're like just talking all in theory. Um, he was like, last week, somebody who came to the short term rental meeting specifically brought up a property that they know is homesteaded because you can see it online that they also know is operating as a short term rental more than 50% of the time. He was like, and they only found one in Bitely that's homesteaded. And I was like, that's definitely mine. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So we're already a point of tension on the very first meeting that these people are having about short-term rentals. And I didn't even know it was an issue. Um, so I was like, we are just going to remove the homestead altogether. I was like, I want to make this very clear. Like, thank you for like talking me through it and like, you know, being transparent about the fact that you would be fine with us keeping Homestead on this, even though it is like seemingly a gray area. I was like, but if this is going to be like a point of tension for people in the city on whether or not like, you know, they see this as an advantage or not, because we're paying primary residence taxes on something that is not functioning as our primary residence. I was like, I'm happy to pay the extra thousand or 2000 or $3,000. Like, I'm happy to pay hotel tax. Like, you just tell me what I owe and how to be the least point of tension person in the town when it comes to short-term rentals so we're removing homestead altogether i don't care how much time we spend there i'm just like paying the extra taxes and moving on so anyway that was a fire today do you know what the additional tax rate is like how much your taxes are actually going to increase um they're going to increase by 40 percent holy fuck <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 40%? <laughs> no wonder yeah. people want it to be a freaking gray area. What I mean, don't get me wrong. These properties make good money. So like, whatever. But oh, that that hurts. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like the taxes are already more expensive because it's a waterfront property. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's 40% more when it's not your primary residence. And so it just, you know, again, it's like, okay, maybe we pay $5,000 or I think when we first moved in, it was like $3,500 a year for taxes, um, property taxes. And no, maybe it's 3500 a season. Maybe it's like six grand a year. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it increases by three to $5,000, I would say, is what it's going to increase by. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Whatever. But good things to know, because like, I wouldn't have known that about this house. I would have, I was going, I was planning on quick claim deeding it into an LLC when we move out. Yeah. Yeah which yeah but like you know i thought it was just the quick claim deed form i talked through it with the guy today and he was like no you need the rescind like you have to send the city assessor a rescind form to get the homestead off the property and then your taxes immediately go up whether you put it in an llc or not so then it's just like all it would look like in the city is that this is not your primary residence but you guys own it so you're not protected by an llc but you're also paying not primary tax rate. You're paying the highest tax rate to have property in the area. And then you quit claim deed, the deed of the property in the deeds office from you to your LLC. And you also have to include a property affidavit, property something affidavit, he said, with the quit claim LLC. And so you need three forms total. One that goes to the assessor, two that go to the deeds office, but the two that go to the deeds office also have to go to the assessor. So you're sending the assessor three papers, the deeds office two papers, and that's it. (laughs) All good things to know. How, and did you talk to your lender? Like, how does that affect your mortgage? Because like mine is a primary residence one as well. And like, I obviously when we were getting our loan I was like hey I'm planning on at that time I was only planning on living in this house for six months before I got it up and running now Mm -hmm. it's going to be closer to a year but even when I told the lender that he was like you can live in this house for two days for all I care as long as you're intending when you buy it for it to be your primary residence but like when you legally are making it not your primary residence anymore what happens I mean nothing happens to your mortgage at all it's like your mortgage would be, I mean, it just is what it is. You already own the property. It doesn't change the price of your property. The only time that your mortgage is ever going to change is if you cash out refi on the property. And then at that point, you're paying the mortgage on the new value of the house, not the value of what you purchased yeah, it for. I think what I mean is like, so your mortgage you go into it signing the documents saying it's going to be a primary residence and when you take the homestead off that's like then saying it's not going to be your primary residence anymore but you're also not selling it to anybody else so like does it it doesn't like affect you being able to keep that loan at all nope doesn't affect anything um same thing like we had this conversation with byron last week because we sit down at the closing table and again like we're using the five percent down conventional loan and the reason we do conventional over fha is because conventional just you know requires your intention for it to be your primary residence for any given amount of time but you're not married to that 12 month requirement like you are with uh, fannie mae or freddie mac and um So we sit down at the table and all of a sudden there's this form that says, you know, you're, you are acknowledging that your intent is to live in this primary residence for 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, call the lender and we've been very vocal with the lender. We're like, yes, we will move into this property. Yes. Like, no, we do not have another primary residence property that we own. Like, you know, this is, this is where we're going to be existing for the time being. Um, but we're like, we've been vocal about the fact that the likelihood of us living here for 12 months is slim to none. Like it will probably be six months, maybe. And, uh, so we call him and I'm like, I can't sign this. And he was like, does it say that you're acknowledging that you will move or live there for 12 months? Or is it saying you acknowledge that the intent is to move there 12 months? And I was like, it doesn't matter either way. The intent is not to live there 12 months. Like, And I'm sitting with the title company, with a lender and with a realtor. And I'm like, I am not like being shady about this, guys. Like, I need you to tell me that like this loan is not going to get called if I move out of this house in six months. 
And all three of them were like, "You will, your loan will now get called if you move out in six months. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't feel good about it, nonetheless. I'm like, okay, you guys are, I don't know. I don't know. Just, they said intent, and here we are. We signed the loan, nonetheless. And, I mean, worst case scenario, if something were to happen, like, we would just move into the house. <laughs> like, that just would be our primary residence for 12 months. Yeah. But we have the luxury of doing that but still nonetheless i'm like does anyone actually know what we're doing here or is everyone just like living in this gray area to like make deals happen well that's what i that's what i think too because like my our mortgage got bought up like a lot of mortgages do and it got bought up by fannie mae but like when we originally signed the loan it's a conventional loan and when we originally signed it that was the intent going in and then like i think it was like three months in all of a sudden it was bought up and i was like okay well does that change like what I'm allowed to do because right. it's still not an FHA loan like I didn't sign an FHA loan I signed a conventional loan right so like what, I don't know what changes about that you know like it's so confusing it's so confusing and it's like every time you really get into the nitty-gritty with someone it's like they don't want to give you like super straight answers and I don't know. I mean, you you want to rely on everyone around you to like be their the expert in their area of expertise. And the entire time I'm like, I've just I'm like 90% we're okay. But like, there's a 10% in me that's just like waiting for someone to be like, you really screwed this up all the way around. And we're taking you to jail now. <laughs> I know. Isn't it so funny? It feels like we're like, always towing the line and then things work out. And then you're like, Oh, no, I actually did do that right. And you like learn for the next time. But it literally always feels like it's going to fall out from under you at any second. Yeah. 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 There's definitely been a huge mental adjustment being an entrepreneur and being in real estate where you're like, are we all just like making it up? That is and the answer exactly is yes. what it feels like. Everybody is making it up. Yeah. Yeah. Which like takes a little bit of the pressure off, but I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one person who's not making it up and actually knows and they're going to come for me. Jeez. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so for our listeners who are listening to this, if you feel like you are running around like a chicken with your head cut off, same girl, same. Literally same. <laughs> and the only peace of mind I have is that like, we're asking these questions and we're getting answers from people that say that like are supposed to be the experts in that field. And so we're trusting mm -hmm. that they are actually the experts in that field. And that's the only thing that's keeping me going because like, how, how am I supposed to know? I'm not the expert, but I asked an expert. Right. Right. Well, and you know, there was a whole era where I was like, when we first started where we didn't even know the questions to ask. And so like, we're running these arbitrage units in a, you know, in an apartment where it's not even legal to arbitrage. And like, we're having to ask, you know, say an apology as opposed to asking for permission. And like, in that era, that was fine, right? We just like didn't have anything to lose. What are they going to do? Like take away the one unit that we spent six grand on? Like it's just a smaller loss. But now when you've got, you know, a million dollars worth of real estate, you're like, look, I've got too much to lose. Like I need this to be legal. I need this to be binding. I need this to be clean. Like I need somebody who does know what's going on to be able to look at this and be like, correct <laughs> like this is it right. you know yeah uh, and it's just trying to figure all that out it's just like the messiest jumbled up chaotic situation that i've ever seen in my life it is very very nerve-wracking for sure don't love it yeah my anxiety doesn't no, love it yeah well let's transition here for a moment and talk about the mentorship a little bit um because now we're on week nine of the first round and on week what four of the second round yeah and we are planning our graduation for them which seems crazy crazy it literally like from february 1st to now it's been like a complete 180 from like what we were doing before it feels like it's so yeah. crazy how different our like day-to-day -day looks because of like yeah. starting this mentorship it's wild to me but I can't believe we're on week nine of the first one already that's crazy I literally emailed cause like every Monday I send out an email to both classes reminding them about class what the topic is this week and I literally was emailing the March session and I was like you guys it's week nine 
like how week nine of 10 how are we already nine weeks into this that seems so yeah. crazy to me oh it is crazy and it has been the most rewarding thing ever like I just feel like you and I were extremely passionate about properties and beautiful spaces and now like I'm obviously so passionate about all of that, but just the relationships we've built, the progress we've watched these people make, like the confidence that they have. I just, I'm like, I could do this a gazillion times over and just feel like so fulfilled from it. It's so fun. And I like the change I see in myself, even just from like talking to people every week and talking about it. Cause like we talk about it between the two of us and we talk about it with our network, but like I have more confidence in what we're doing just from talking to other people who are like at the beginning of their journey and like it's all things like we're teaching them things that we've done right like I've done all of the things that we're teaching to a certain extent but I just actually talking it through with them and like running through specific scenarios I feel so much more confident in it too and so it's like built confidence in me I'm so excited watching them like every property they're sending I'm like deep diving into it and I'm like oh my gosh you could put this in this room and like I get so excited about it too. It's so fun. We literally had a call with somebody today and they were like, why are you doing mentorship? Like you have social media, you guys obviously have Airbnbs, like why are you doing it? And we were like, we love it. Like I love the ability <laughs> to give this opportunity or like help people get this opportunity. It's so fun. Right. Right. Well, and I feel like there's like, Ethan, now that he's kind of stepping away from insurance to a certain degree, like him and I have spent so much time as of recent looking back on the way that he built that business and like what he would do different, not insurance specific, but just in business in general. Um, and the most common or like the biggest standout point to him and how he would do things differently is specifically hiring a CEO to like direct him and Kenny and like reel them in in a sense and be like this is the direction that we're pursuing right now like let everything else kind of push out and just like double down here and I feel like that's what John has kind of done for us is like we filled like we were spending more time working with less reward and less traction previous to launching the mentorship and then having John come in and be like all right ladies let's reel it in like let's like we're doing this thing I'm gonna structure it you guys have to show up you have to perform you have to say the things that you know you have to like you know really help these people you have to have a heart for helping people and I'm like we can do all that it's just like sticking to one thing because I think you and I both as entrepreneurs and as like entrepreneurs who don't have other entrepreneurs like in our immediate surroundings with parents or husbands or whoever else like we don't have that like solid mentorship, we'll get like distracted or go on these little rabbit holes or I will go on the rabbit hole and then I'm like bringing you with me and you're like, Sarah, why another rabbit hole? <laughs> but having John like reel us in, I just feel like now we've like found a little bit better of a work-life balance with Carwell's and we found something that we're extremely passionate about and we've got someone to keep us on the right track. And I feel like that entire little ecosystem is just like, feels good. Yeah. Yeah, I will say because, like, obviously, like, this is our job. So, like, in order for us to continue doing this, we have to make money, right? And before, when we were, like, we were trying to figure out ways to still help bring so much value to people, but also, like, make an income because we needed to in order to continue for this to be our job. And we just couldn't figure out, like, how to put what we knew into something that people would want to pay for so that we could continue giving that knowledge and it was like John just brought that thing to life because like as much as like giving people free knowledge is so much fun on social media like we still have bills to pay we still have properties to get up and running like we still have things that we need to make money for and so it was like how can we do that while also like continuing to bring people all of the things that we want to bring them right Right. And I think too, there's like a component of just like not understanding. I don't even know if it's, I can't say this across the board, but not understanding like your value personally and like selling that value well when you're selling yourself. It's like all day long, I can like 
sell the heck out of Airbnb, right? Like why you should get started in Airbnb, like why you should start investing in real estate. Like I can speak so passionately about that. But then when it comes to like selling us as mentors, like all of this like insecurity and like self-limiting thoughts and like self-doubt starts like creeping in. And so all of a sudden you start like thinking about where you would price this at and who you would target it to and what you would include in it. And it's like the amount of time that we wanted to put in it was this much. The amount that we wanted to charge for it was this much. And like that wouldn't have created a great product because then we're exhausted and we're not making money. So we're not in turn like creating anything that's like something we're going to do over and over again. And same thing when like John was selling his services to someone that we know in the space. It's like he can sell us so well. Like he can sit on all these calls with us and our potential mentees and he can like really articulate well what our knowledge is worth and he can sell that all day long. But when it comes to selling himself, he struggles with it, even though we could sell him easily all day long. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like having that third person in the mix when you're selling yourself as the service, you have to have that third person to come in and sell you for you because you're never going to be able to sell yourself as passionately as someone who is an outsider looking in. And so it's just been one of those relationships where I look at like our dynamic with John and I'm like, John needs us to sell his services because they are worth more than he charges. Like Mm -hmm. I would pay 2x what we paid for him all day long and not even blink an eye now being on the other side of it. And like, we needed him to sell us because we were like, I don't know, are we valuable? Are we better than the rest? But like, he's looking at us and he's being like, literally like, yes, like, I don't know why you girls are doubting yourself. And so yeah, it's just been really nice having a third person. That is interesting that you say that because I, I literally, the second you said somebody else selling you, it made me think of when we were at the conference and like Bill Faith has created like his super team. And all of the people on his team are like experts in their own space, but he's standing up there talking about the fact that they're experts. They're not up there calling themselves experts, but he's standing up there and he's talking about how incredible all of them are. And I think that that, it sounds more powerful coming from somebody who's actually worked with somebody before than like it coming from yourself, at least to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's, Like now, you know, now that we're like dissecting this with John and just that like extra dynamic, it's like my husband, same thing with your husband. I don't know if he does this. They're both in sales. And my husband is like the salesman that like, I mean, he's got a good personality for sales for sure, but he is like an absolute like nerd when it comes to the psychology, like the human psychology behind selling. And like, not being sleazy about it, but just like, if you know that you're an expert in something and you know the value that you bring, there's this whole entire period of selling someone that is not about selling the product at all. It's about selling yourself and building that trust to then get them to drop their walls and be able to receive the information that you're giving. And so Ethan would always like, anytime he was training someone, he would be like, you need to call a third party person to just validate what you're saying. He was like, it doesn't have to be your boss. It doesn't have to be someone high up. He's like, but what you're going to do is like, if there's someone that's doubting the thing that you're selling and you know that you're putting them in a better position, call me and be like, oh, I think I've got this all right, but let me call the absolute expert on this one product. Let me just run it past him, double check it. And what they don't know is he's like texting whoever his closest coworker is being like, hey, can you third party verify me? And then he calls them and he's like, hey, so-and-so, I've got a question. I know you're an expert on this. Can you just verify that this is correct? And just like them having validation from somebody else who's not trying to make the sale validate what he's selling, he's like, the the sales just went through the roof. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's what we're doing with John and John's doing it with him is like, you just, you know, it's just this like getting people to let their walls down and realize that you are actually genuinely trying to help them and not trying to like, sell them some sort of a pipe dream (laughs) yep tyler does that same exact thing because he'll be in there having all these conversations but then like even when he goes to thailand like sometimes he's brought out the chemist with him because like he's like i know that this product is going to be better for them it's going to lower their usage it's going to save them so much money it's higher ticket up front and that's like a really hard thing to sell is something that's higher ticket up front but it's going to save you money in the long run and so he's like it's super hard for me to do that so then i bring a chemist in and everybody wants to listen to the chemist talk about how the products work. It's so much easier right. once they talk to the chemist. 
Yeah, yeah, it's that psychology behind it. It's just, it's 100% about trust. Yep. 100% about trust. Trust and then just like the security and the confidence knowing that you are going to be able to pull through yeah. and like offer them the value that they're expecting. Yeah, and it is so nice like now being kind of towards the end of the first one and hearing people talk about how much value they're finding in it and seeing them like just recently is somebody who's like sent us a few properties to analyze for her she sent us a video of analyzing her own property I didn't send this to you I messaged her personally and like talked to her talked to her about her property but she sent us one and she ran through the analysis and I was like you did so good like this is a great property yeah. the money looks great on it and I was like it's definitely worth like looking at your closest competition, make sure that you're like implementing these things into this property. So you need to factor that into your budget. But like, she did so well. And I was like, it's so fun to see because at the beginning, she was like, I don't know anything about analyzing a property. And now she's like doing it on her own. Right, right. And none of these things are complicated. Like, I think two parts here is like one, People may look at us online and their consumer content and they're going to be they're like, oh, my gosh, I could just like never get to the place that they're at. And I feel like people forget that, like, we're still learning, like, literally daily, learning new things about real estate. And we've been doing it for four years. Um, and two, it's just, like, it, none of this stuff, like, is rocket science, right? It's not like you're giving brain surgery to somebody. It's not like you're trying to understand the intricacies of insurance. It's not like it's not like you're trying to figure out how to like build some crazy piece of technology where you'd have to have like this big education for it. Like all of this is like one completely like pretty easily learnable mm -hmm. and implementable and scalable. Like it's, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, we doubt what we know because it, none of it has been like hard to wrap our brain around, but it's taken us a long time to get the information to wrap our brain around. And so if we can like give somebody all that information in 10 weeks and be like, you have the, like you have way more than we had at the beginning. Like you're already starting out on a much like more stable foot than we ever started out on. Like don't th quit questioning yourselves. Like just jump off the ledge. You totally can do this. So I don't know. It's just the mentorship has been incredible. I would do it a million times over. If you guys are listening to this and considering getting into mentorship, like Emily and I have just had our lives flipped upside down, both by offering it and paying for it ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been such a cheat this year. Yeah, I feel so attached to the people in our class too. Like, I'm just like thinking about <laughs> doing more. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna have so many people that I'm attached to because like now we're just going to be watching everybody else's journey going on because I fully am just like watching everything they're doing I'm like okay invested yeah I'm fully invested in their journeys now too yeah well and we're planning an amazing graduation party let's kind of wrap up on this note um so for us I mean we've been vocal about what we made on this mentorship. I think it was $186,000 for these two classes that we put through, um, which was obviously a huge blessing in Emily and I's life. Uh, we never anticipated making that amount, but we did, you know, we're committed to making the impact that that amount <laughs> has allowed us to uh, make. But um, we decided to pour quite a bit of the money that we made on it into a graduation for our mentees. Um, which we're stoked about. I think Emily and I, um, you know, just have a heart for helping people first and foremost, um, and really pouring into people and also making sure that what we're doing adds value to our lives, right? Like community and, and having this like circle around us has brought so much value. And so for us, we're like, okay, we really want to take these relationships and we want to like bring life to them by meeting in person because, you know, it's great getting to know people online for 10 weeks and like staring at them through Zoom once a week. Um, but meeting them in person, it's like you become friends, friends, mm -hmm. you know, you're like part of the circle. Um, and so we're bringing everyone who decides to join us to Chicago second week in June. We're bringing in some guest speakers that you guys are familiar with online that we socialize with. Um, we haven't announced this to our students yet, but by the time this comes out, I'm sure it'll be booked. We are renting a yacht for the afternoon, which is going to be a blasty blast for me. Emily hates boats, so she's going to be taking Dramamine. <laughs> I don't hate boats. I just get seasick and sunburned. <laughs> yeah. 
boats don't like you. Yeah, so. boats don't like me. I would love to have a great time on a boat. Don't get me wrong. But boats don't love me. <laughs> yeah. So we decided to do Chicago because it's within driving distance of us. And Chicago in the summer is just like magical. It's amazing. Um, So anyway, you guys will see a ton of content come from that probably mid-June, but um, we will absolutely do a graduation for the mentorships that we host in the future as well. Um, I mean, you guys know we reinvest 100% of our money that we earn in life into our businesses, um, and this is just an extension of that, right? We made some great money on it, and now we're going to pour that money right back into our students. So um we're ready for those lives to or for those relationships to come to life in person we're ready to party on a boat with them we're ready to uh make a gazillion dollars off of real estate with them and watch their lives change too so um if you were considering joining our mentorship and listening to that that is something that you have to look forward to if you join on the next round yeah but yeah that's that's all our updates for right now uh hopefully the next big update I have is that my property is almost done because uh, I'm ready to be moving on to the next thing. So hopefully that <laughs> happens uh, relatively soon. Yes. And Emily and Tyler are considering moving where Ethan and I are currently um, residing, me. which means that <laughs> yeah, means that I get to bother her in person even more than I get to bother her now. But um we have dale who you guys heard on the podcast where we talked about nicole dale is kind of like the third wing to our our best friend duo over here um and dale lives in muskegon as well where ethan and i are currently hanging out so if me emily and dale are all back in the same city together it's been over a decade since we've lived by each other i know that's which is so crazy to me I know. Look at us having the whole fam back together. It's so exciting. Wild. But yeah, so maybe our podcasts will be filmed sitting next to each other if we live across the hall from each other. Oh, those are always the best. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that is all for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. I know y'all are pretty vocal about loving listening to Emily and I just uh, chat it up. So here's another episode where you get to do just that. Um, and we will catch you next time. Bye. Bye.